it was uh, with a Gamora boss had come to speak to my nan and my dad. The guy who had done something to them had lived in our area. He was well known to us. He'd done work with my family uh, and he'd d he disrespected them somehow to do with the job, with something they'd done and he came to ask permission to kill him. I knew someone was going to get killed and I couldn't stop it. In Calabria, there's the Andrangheta Mafia, which Andrina means like family, united family. My actual family are from southern Italy, which is the toe of Italy, Calabria. Uh, like you've got the Cosa Nostra in Sicily, at Gamara in, in Naples, the Andrina is the Calabrian. So, as I said, we formed generations of that when my father is and my grandma, my nonna. They decided to, my, no, my nonna decided to leave Calabria and go up north to Milan in the early 60s. Um, still affiliated with the family down south, but it was an, uh, an element aside to them, but always had the backup of them. They were um, uh, smuggling cigarettes from Switzerland. Um, that was the beginning of it, and then f uh, they eventually got to hard drugs and all the rest. My mother was English, and my father is Italian. Uh, she was an au pair, she went over to Italy in the early 70s, sorry, uh, late 60s, and she met my father there. Within a couple of months, she got pregnant with me. Couldn't speak any English till I came over here when I was nine. I had to go straight to school and, and learn, and within a couple of years I was just like another English child of my age of 11 going to high school. And then as I, every year my mother took me back to Italy. So I lived in the UK from the age of nine, but I yearned to go back to my family there. Over here, my family, they weren't very, you know, there wasn't many of them. The Italian family are much warmer in a way of this sort of, very family orientated, where I'm not saying that here that in the UK they're not as, but it was a totally different way of life over there uh, in Italy. So I yearned for that. I yearned to see my cousins, my aunties, my uncles, and you know, to feel a belonging, the closeness, the love, the loyalty, the everything that comes with it. How much did you know about who your dad was? What was he doing whilst you were growing up? My father by then was on the run. Uh, for murder. He ran off to, he was a fugitive in America. So I didn't see him from the age of nine till I was 13. So of course, he then got uh, arrested in America, extradited to Italy, uh, convicted of manslaughter. People ask me, you know, what age did I realise there's something going on? And that was the age, 13, that I sort of put into, obviously, I'm going to see my father in prison. But to be fair, he was in and out when I was younger. So, but that happens elsewhere with other families, but they're not the mafia, if you will. So with, with our family, it was the element of the organized crime that I didn't quite know until I was that age of 13. And then, um, and even then it's like this, you, do, you still don't realize the seriousness of it. And I suppose when you, the, the importance in a way of I was my daddy's little princess. I was his, you know, the apple of his eye. As soon as I was 17, I'd met the father of my child, Lara. He was actually um, from a bakery. There were bakers, his family, very normal. I remember I didn't like him at first, but all the girls were after him, and I didn't like the way that he was because of that. <laughs> but then he made me laugh so much that I fell for him. The family weren't happy about that. My dad wasn't, he was still in prison. So then my nan intervened and said, no, they're in love, leave them alone. You've got to accept it. So my, my dad accepted that. So I had big daddy issues as well back then because my father never had time for me. Um, he'd get like five kilos of gold from a payment and or to pay something with and he'd take a bracelet out and go, oh. And I'd like, yeah, nice. But it wasn't that that I wanted, it was, the time with him. And my father always wanted a boy and he always made sure that I sort of knew about it indirectly. 
So there's an occasion when I was eight years old and he took me to a restaurant with some of his friends and he sat there and he said, oh, I want this boy, I want this boy, I want this boy. And I burst out crying apparently. And I think a lot of my getting involved in, it wasn't about the power or about the money or about the, it was the love, the loyalty, the, the need of him. So by the time of 18, I've moved back to Milan. Um, sort of on the sidelines of the organisation. Then slowly I become involved and more involved and more involved with things, mainly the money side of it, the laundering. So taking money to pay for shipments of cannabis. Um, by this time, the Class A drugs such as uh, cocaine mostly and heroin they were into. It was uh, supplying a lot of Europe with it as well. Of course, ecstasy tablets had just come out then, so they were swapping in deals. And I was the one that, I didn't ever go and get the drugs or see them, or I was the one that went to pay for them or put the money in the bank. Now, I know that, I mean, it's a big responsibility and I mean, I was 19, <laughs> you know, 19, 20, 21. It was all them years of, I look at my children now and I think, oh my God, I wouldn't ever, put that, that responsibility and that onto them, especially with crime. But I had all that and I never had an, an adult take me to one side and say, this is wrong, this is the seriousness of what you're doing. It becomes a life, you become so, so into that that it becomes that it's normal, whatever normal is. It becomes like, and just you know, people say, well, how can you, I knew right from wrong and I knew I'm not a bad person. I like to think I'm not a bad person. But it just, I can't even explain when it becomes a normal way of life. And when everybody's in it and everybody's doing it, that's how it was. So how did it progress from money laundering up? From that, my dad got arrested over some old things. And this was back in 92. So he managed then to escape. He was then... Fugitive. He went on the run. He went across to Spain, then Portugal. That's where he was arrested the next year. So as soon as he was arrested in '93, of course, as a fugitive, he could still run his and you know all his his, his organisation. But then he got arrested in Portugal in '93. So I had to step in. I had by then pulled myself out massively from the organisation because I just had my daughter in '91. I become I became a mum. The reality slapped me in the face and I really put my, I actually wanted to get out because I realised more and more the seriousness of everything that was going to happen. So, and of course him being arrested had to pull me back in because, you know, when the ship's down, the, everybody comes to eat, you know, they all want a piece of everything to the point where my uncle even threatened me to take over my dad's operations. I stepped in, I went to see him in prison every week. I used to travel from Milan. They'd arrested my then husband, the father of my daughter. So I used to travel to, from Milan to Madrid on a Saturday, see my ex-husband, then travel that same evening to Lisbon and then go to, I think it was Oporto prison there to see my father on the Sunday and the Sunday night get the plane back to Milan. So that was, for a year, that was my life. What kind of decisions you had to make though? Well, uh, things like with shipment if something didn't go right. There was tons, like five tons at a time coming across of cannabis and it was being distribu distributed all over. I think there's nine countries involved. You know, Holland, Germany, just across Europe it was going. I mean, I used to wear Bridget Joan knickers and go and take hundreds of thousands just tucked in my knickers on airplanes, you know, abroad. What would you say was kind of the most serious thing you were involved in when you look back at it? I think the most serious is I knew someone was going to get killed and I couldn't stop it. And that's the most thing that carried that had the heaviest weight on my shoulders because of that, because it was somebody that I knew and um, I knew his wife and his children and it was uh, with a Gamora mo boss had come to speak to my nan and my dad. They actually got life for this. And um, 
the guy who had done something to them had lived in our area. He was well known to us. He'd done work with my family uh, and he'd he disrespected them somehow to do with the job, with something they'd done. And he came to ask permission to kill him on our grounds, if you will. So I overheard all this is talked about in the kitchen and I overheard it. Uh, I was probably about 19. And um, so I think that, well, what was I supposed to, supposed to go to the police? Was I supposed to tell them, well, no, you can't do this. Or, because they, the Gamara would have turned on us. They would have started a war. So we can't, you can't just, it's not that simple to stop something. And I always say that, you know, I can't, uh, and that, I think that's probably the, the most, the worst thing ever is knowing someone was going to die. And the pain and the, that that family will have had. And, and, I, and I knew when it happened as well, you know, and I knew, and not stopping that. At, at that age, I'd, I let it go over my head. But it was always there in my subconscious because as I got older, you know, I'm talking about all this now, the way that I am, but there's been buckets of tears in between all this. Whilst your dad is in, is in this prison in Portugal and you're running the, the organisation, I want to ask you about your gran and what was her role? Was she still actively part of the organisation? Was she running things? Well, yeah, my, so my nan, she was the logistics. So without my nan, my, my dad couldn't run his organisation and without my dad, she couldn't run it. So he was the one that was out there getting all the business and becoming because the mentality was quite restricted to, to be in Italy. My dad was the one that took it outside of Italy, that, that it went big and global, you know, and, and into. So my nan was still there at that time when I had to take over. She wasn't very happy with me about taking over, but it was mainly because my dad trusted my nan, my nonna, but he didn't trust her with the money because she was very weak with her other, with my dad's siblings. They were very, you know, a lot were takers and uh, didn't, didn't pull the weight in the organisation, but expected nice things. And so it was there, the, the weakness that she had of giving to others. It wasn't because he didn't trust her. I mean, I've, I've read that her nickname was Nonna Herring. Yeah. Well, that's like newspapers named her that. And that again, you know, she was, she was that. And this is a woman that couldn't read or write. Mm. She couldn't, she had no education. She'd come from Southern Italy with no, I think the first child she had at 16. She was, you know, so, but she was so clever <laughs> in other ways. She was so in mind. I mean, she died. She was, she was still on house arrest at 86. And she couldn't even move physically, but the police would be like, no, she, her mind is too, she's too uh, dangerous. Her mind is damn laugh at, at it. But, but my nan, it was all about feeding her family. It was all about a way of earning money to the point where, because my, my, I mean, probably about four of my dad's siblings have died of heroin. And she was so scared of them going out there and getting it from somebody, then it wasn't any good, it would, oh, they would overdose, that she would give it to them herself. And as a mother, you know, that is harsh. That is, you know, everybody, you can stand back and be judgmental about that. But actually, when you live in that world and you know what's out there and what do you do? do you protect? She took them to rehab. She paid thousands to get them right. It bribed them with new cars and gold and everything. It didn't work. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's, that it's right. But what I'm saying is, it was it wrong as a mother? For you know, it's like each to the each. You just don't know until you're in a situation like that. You do not know how you would act. How long did your crime career last for till you got into prison? Well, um, there was a few arrests in '93 in Italy. It was because people started talking. They got arrested and and started talking. Which one of them was my dad's sister? So she basically took the whole organisation down, especially her mother, my father, her own son. And I had the weekends where I used to go to Portugal, to Madrid, and 
I, I just before I got on because I used to have to leave my daughter with my in-laws at the time. She was only about two. So I used to check in and ring and say, right, I'm going to get the flight, I'm coming home. And they said, don't come back, there's been loads of arrests of your family. Uh, don't come back. So I had to just get my, my bag off the plane, so I had an emergency, got off the plane, got the next flight to London, then up north to my mother. And I was absolutely going out of my mind because my daughter was in Milan. So what I did was, uh, thankfully, she was on my passport, my British passport. So I got a family member to bring her to the border in France. And I got a flight to Nice, got the train, went to get her at the border, Ventimiglia, I think that's called. I went just over, got her and came away. Cause my, so in Italy, you have your maiden name and you keep that. So my name is Di Giovine, my maiden name. So if they were looking for someone, it was Di Giovine, but on my British passport, it was Mariko, my husband's name. So I thought, I can't, I'd rather get, be in prison than be without my daughter. I have to risk and go and get my daughter. Uh, then I came to the UK and sort of kept my head down, which wasn't much good because I transferred the money from a Swiss bank account to an English bank account and bought myself a house and thought I could just get laid low. And no, the customer exercise came a year later, 90, June 94. So what was the prison sentence? What, how long did you get into? I got three years and nine months in the UK for money laundering because I'd moved the money from Switzerland into the UK. And I got uh, 10 years in Italy. That was then extradited to Italy. And I got 10 years over there, which was then, because I sort of pleaded sort of guilty, it got reduced to six years. What about your dad and your nan? What, what was happening to them? Were they, they still involved in the crime? No, they were, they, by that time they were in prison. So when the arrests came, I sort of tried to avoid, but I couldn't the year after. My nan was arrested in the first, 93. My dad was inside in Portugal. The whole family was in prison by then. So in doing, you know, they got 30 years life. Um, and my, Dad and my nonna got 30 years in life because of what I mentioned before, that, that hit from the Gamara of allowing it to happen. Even though it was indirectly, they said, you know, they'd given the go-ahead. Uh, yeah. And so what happened to your nan? She was on, uh, she came out, oh God, I, I managed to see them in 2013. I hadn't seen them for 13 years. My father as well, I didn't see him for all that time. I saw him at a trial. And I managed to see my nan. By then my nan was on house arrest. Because uh, of health-wise, health. So that's, and that's what I mentioned, she died <laughs> on house arrest. And what about uh, your dad? My sister wrote to him, I've got a younger sister, and saying that she felt an orphan and she's this and that. And it hit something somewhere and he just thought, I've had enough, I'm going to die in here. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not, I've got my children or ones in prison, the other this. And, and he said, right, he's changed his life. He said, the only way I'm going to be able to change my life, I'm either going to die in here and go out and do everything over again because that's the life I only know. I only know that life. He basically told everything that he'd done, given up everything that he had, anything that they didn't manage to get, he gave it to the authorities. He's left witness protection now. He's living a normal, he's a chef now. <laughs> he's a chef in Italy, um, which is good. You know, he's left that life behind, he's, he's gone, which you, you never think, you, you, I thought he'd had a die in prison or die on the streets, to be honest, because of the life that he led. When you look, Back at it all, what are you feeling like? Is there anything you regret? Is it... There's a lot of regrets. The main ones, the hurt I caused my mother, my child at the time. You know, she was very young, thankfully. She's turned out okay. <laughs> she's a good girl, you know, she's... Um, 
I think that's my biggest regret, my, my mother and hurting her and indirectly hurting other people somehow. If I could, if I could take back the indirectiveness of hurting people, I would take that back. Definitely, any day, straight away. You know, you know that's that's the thing that, I've, I've, not just my mother and just anybody indirectly that's been hurt with this, with the organisation, with, because they will have been through the drugs they bought, through the you know, it's down the line the ripples. Of, of the damage that you've caused. Thankfully, I've turned it around. I've, I've bettered myself out of something bad and making good, positive. People say, oh, but you're a different person from back then. I said, no, I'm not. I'm still me. I was still like this then. I just learned to not see life like that. I learned to do different things in life. It's almost like... You learning to habilitate to understand that was wrong, you know. I never wanted that anyway. It was circumstances. It was born into it. It was. Uh, so now it's. I mean, I three years ago I was a self-employed cleaner. I, I, it's not. I, I, I'd rather clean someone else's toilets and go down them lines again. This is what I'm trying to say. You know, you you re, you have to reinvent yourself. You have to re gain all your strength to to have another life as in a better life. You just need to be willing enough and strong enough to, and have the right people around you, support and love and your family. In 1975, I actually took an oath uh, with five other gentlemen, became a sworn maid member of the family. And just to show you how fortunate I am, the five guys that I took the oath with, they were all murdered later on, every one of them. None of them survived.